Hello and welcome to the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics Seminar Series. I'm Angel Petropanagos and I'll be the moderator for today's session. Our speakers today are Sarah Kawagachi and Bill Ma, and their seminar is entitled Clinical Complexity in Medical Assistance in Dying, a Psychiatric and Palliative Care Perspective. Before I introduce today's speakers, I'd like to let you know the seminar is being recorded. This lecture, along with other archived lectures, can be accessed through the Joint Center for Bioethics website. The format of our seminar is a presentation by our speakers, followed by a facilitated discussion period. First, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this land, this meeting place is still home to many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. We also stand in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism and systemic discrimination. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Sarah Kawaguchi is a palliative care physician at Mount Sinai Hospital. Her primary interest is in medical education, and she's the program director for the Enhanced Skills Palliative Care Residency Program at the University of Toronto, as well as the education co-lead for the Tammy Latner Center for Palliative Care. Dr. Bill Ma is a consultation liaison psychiatrist with Sinai Health System and an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He works closely with the palliative care team at Mount Sinai and has a special interest in providing end-of-life care in HIV psychiatry. Dr. Ma has been involved as an assessor for MAID. Now, I'm Dr. Ma and Dr. Kawaguchi, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Angel, for the introduction, um, and thanks to everybody for, for joining online. Um, so we'll, we'll take probably about um, 30, 35 minutes for um, the, the talking portion, um, and then we'll take questions and discussion afterwards. So if you can um, just save your, your questions um, for that period of time, that would be great. Um, my understanding is you can put that into the chat and that will sort of get compiled and Angel will help to facilitate the discussion uh, after the didactic part. Um, yeah, so obviously a very timely uh, talk to be given, um, given the recent announcement around Bill C-7, which will which we'll come to. Um, so first off, no actual or potential conflicts to disclose from either myself uh, or Dr. Ma, um, other than the, the fact uh, that was already mentioned, which is that we've both participated as made assessors. Um, and uh, we recognize that there, there's a breadth of um, opinions out there around MAID and, and um, comfort levels with participating um, with assessment and provision of MAID. Um, and we very much recognize uh, every clinician's uh, right to conscientious objection um, in regard to MAID. Um, so just by way of objectives, um, I'm realizing now that I, I didn't edit this. Um, the last time we, we prepared this talk, um, Bill C-7 was just a proposed uh, bill and it's now been passed through both the Senate and the House. Um, so we'll actually be reviewing the old bill um, and, and the new legislation that's just come into effect uh, in the past several days uh, around MAID uh, in Canada. Um, we'll address some of the challenges that we've encountered in assessing patients with life-limiting illnesses, uh, specifically um, who also have concurrent psychiatric comorbidities, um, and, uh, and also explore factors involved in suffering that may precipitate a MAID request and sort of how we would uh, address those. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Ma um, just to sort of walk you through uh, the, the previous legislation um, that was put in place in June 2016 um, that's now been updated with Bill C-7, which we'll come to later in the talk. Great. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, oops. Uh, just skip the slide ahead. Can we go back a slide? Perfect. Um, so this will be very quick. Uh, I'm assuming that many people out there are already quite familiar with this legislation, and I think we want to leave time to talk about the new legislation. Um, but just to review what we're talking about, and this is the context in which we've actually seen this particular case that we're going to present. So we thought this would be important to put forward as well. Um, again, people are eligible um, 
uh, when they're 18 years of age or older, they're capable of making decisions on their own, that they don't actually feel pressure to make decisions from other people around them, that the person has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, um, that the request is completely voluntary again and not the result of some sort of external pressure from another source, um, and uh, that uh, there's true informed consent after the individual uh, actually has a good understanding of both their uh, condition, uh, illness, disability, um, and uh, the potential treatments that are available for it. Um, and just to go into the grievous and irremediable um, sort of criteria a little bit more, next slide. Um, this is what the current legislation says, and in fact, uh, this is what has probably changed in the new legislation, just a reminder. Um, it's a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability where a person is in an advanced state of irreversible declining capability. Um, the illness, disease, disability, or state of decline causes them physical or psychological suffering, it's usually both, um, that is intolerable to them and that cannot be relieved under conditions that they consider to be acceptable. This is very important because we can obviously propose a lot of treatment and if the person decides that those treatments are not in keeping with their value system um, or their goals of care, then we uh, obviously respect that, um, although it is important that we make the person aware of those treatment uh, uh, possibilities. Um, this is the one that's been controversial and the one that actually has been uh, uh, challenged recently in court and <clears throat> has been struck down. The natural death has become reasonably foreseeable, um, taking into account all of the medical circumstances without a prognosis necessarily having been made. Um, so just a reminder of sort of what things are. Um, I think we'll quickly move into the case and start discussing the case so that we can talk about what we've learned from it. Yeah, so um, I'll talk a little bit about a case we encountered at uh, Mount Sinai Hospital uh, a few years ago um, that then turned into a, a CMAJ case report and prompted us to really think through some of these complexities uh, around MADE assessments. And as Dr. Ma mentioned, the, the reason for um, outlining Bill C-14, even though it's been overridden now by Bill C-7, is that's the context that we were operating within um, when we were tackling this case. Um, it also just helps to sort of um, ground the discussion around um, some of the, the clinical challenges around capacity uh, for decision making that we sort of uh, came up with in this guy in particular. So, um, so this is Mr. S. He, he was a 75 year old gentleman with a new diagnosis of metastatic pancreatic cancer. Um, he had opted against chemotherapy or any other systemic therapy in form, uh, sorry, in favor of a palliative uh, approach to his care, um, which was going to be spearheaded by his family doc. Um, he uh, was taken to the Sinai uh, emergency department after a, a hydromorphone overdose um, in an apparent suicidal attempt. And that's where we met him. Um, that's where we also learned that he had inquired about um, making a, a request for MAID uh, with his family doctor two weeks prior. And the, and the family doc had said that, uh, that she would look into it, but nothing had sort of been uh, initiated. And so this was sort of him taking matters in his own hands. Um, so I'll hand it over to Dr. Ma just to sort of reflect on um, that capacity piece that I mentioned, which is so critical uh, in these assessments, especially for a guy who's coming in with um, an intended uh, overdose. Sure. So, I mean, when we think about the presentation of this case, it's actually quite dramatic. Um, this is a fellow with quite late stage cancer who comes in with quite a, a lethal overdose attempt. Um, and we're lucky that we uh, inhabit the uh, universe we do where there's so many subspecialists here. Um, so both Dr. Kawaguchi and myself were available to see him within the ER and it quickly struck us that uh, a few things were necessary in terms of assessment. Um, and uh, one of the first things to find out was basically just to find out what he understood about um, his illness, what he understood about sort of what was going on, and indeed to kind of find out what was behind the suicide attempt, if we could uh, have him uh, reflect on that. Um, so within the context of that, we think that um, one of the key learning points here is just the idea of 
what an assessment of capacity looks like in this case. Because um, there's a lot of concern um, that when psychiatric symptoms appear that it may actually impair capacity. Um, so we thought that it'd be very interesting, at least first of all, useful to go through what capacity actually uh, constitutes. So at a very basic level, we want to make sure that the person understands the information that's being given to them. So basically, in this case, what does he understand about his disease state and what does he understand about prognosis, for example? Is he able to take that information in and apply it to his particular circumstances? So knowing kind of what his prognosis is, knowing what his sort of life circumstances are, um, knowing what the effect that disease has on his life circumstances, for example, would be very important to try to ascertain. Figuring out what his reasoning is in terms of sort of how he's thinking about the process that he's undergoing. Um, thinking about the reasoning behind, for example, the suicide attempt or taking the overdose of hydromorphone. The idea of actually making a choice, I think, is really important in this idea of uh, capacity. Again, it's the idea that once you understand info, you've applied it, you have actually reasoned it through, you're actually, again, making a choice that's on the basis of your values, on the basis of what you think is appropriate for yourself. And it's hard to say sometimes that this isn't due to pressure on the outside because clearly when we make choices for ourselves, a lot of people consider the circumstances around them, including people around them and their reactions. Um, so I think even that's very important to try to ascertain. And finally, the most important thing about assessment of capacity is again, the ability to even communicate a choice. Um, so if he's, for example, unconscious, we have no idea what's going on here, right? Um, so this seems very basic and seems very obvious, but in people who have, for example, um, dysarthria or difficulty communicating, this becomes much more of an issue. So I think it's important to highlight in this context. So back to you, Sarah. Yeah, so, so taking all of those factors into consideration, when, when we met with him that day in the emergency, we I think we both felt that he was making a, a capable request for MAID. Um, and he articulated the fear of uh, progressive abdominal pain and dyspnea, which he was experiencing currently, um, as well as fear of future disability as the primary reasons for his, for his request. Um, and he shared with us that he he actually would prefer to sort of go down the legal route of uh, pursuing MAID rather than committing suicide. Um, and the suicidal attempt or gesture was sort of uh, more in our minds a cry for help. Um, and um, he, he had no previous psychiatric history. Um, he certainly um, seemed to be exhibiting psychiatric symptoms of some sort in terms of this sort of cry for help um, that Dr. Ma can sort of elaborate further on in terms of the significance. Um, but ultimately, we didn't feel that he needed to be put under a Form 1 um, upon admission to hospital. We opted to admit him voluntarily, which he agreed to, um, with the plan to sort of monitor this, um, this query suicidality um, and then uh, consider putting him on a form if there were significant safety concerns. Um, and I, sh I should mention that um, we didn't sort of jump to, um, you know, having him sign a, a request form for me just based on this one encounter with him in the emergency room. Although we felt he was capably requesting this, our approach was to um, just sort of serially explore this further with him and, and get to know a little bit better um, what sorts of things he valued, what, what we could do to sort of help his physical symptoms, how much he wanted help with that, uh, and that sort of piece. Sure. Um, so, so one of the things that we struggled with right off the bat was even the idea of certifying this individual um, and what the optics would be to certify somebody under a mental health act um, when in fact this might have been a different version of uh, suicide or a different interpretation of what suicide meant. Uh, uh, the certification of somebody under Mental Health Act would imply that there is a mental health condition that is interfering with this guy's function or puts him at great risk for suicide. Um, so that was actually the first struggle. And we were actually quite glad that he agreed to come into hospital voluntarily. 
Um, I think this is a very dense slide, and I'm going to talk a little bit more than what's just on this slide. I'm going to start with that second point, multiple interpretations of suicidal gestures exist. Um, so there's a lot of people who feel that suicidality only exists within the context of depression or a depressive disorder. Um, I don't think that's true, and I think a lot of psychiatrists would probably agree that this is not true. There are some psychiatrists who would actually disagree with me as well. Um, I think what we think is very important here is that when somebody makes a, a gesture like this man made, it is so important to understand what the thinking process was behind it and to try to sort of figure out um, what are the factors that are actually pushing a desire for haste and death. And we know on the basis of a lot of psychiatric and palliative literature that things like chronic pain, poorly managed symptoms, um, push design, <clears throat> excuse me, disability, um, uh, loss of function, um, push somebody's desire for haste and death, particularly when symptoms are uncontrolled. Um, and indeed, uh, when this fellow came in, there seemed to be quite a few uncontrolled symptoms. Um, so we didn't just want to jump to a conclusion and we wanted to make sure that we um, uh, had a proper assessment of what the suicidality meant point here is suicidality comes in lots of different forms and, and different guises. When we talk about suicidality, a lot of people sort of fall into the um, fundamental psychiatric lexicon and make assumptions that I think are important to question um, and to actually realize that suicidality doesn't always come with a psychiatric illness. Some, in fact, some people see suicide as a reasonable gesture um, to escape a very unreasonable or overwhelming situation. The other thing that is important to note in this case is the presence of a lot of concurrent psychiatric symptoms. Um, and symptoms do not constitute the syndrome or a disorder. Um, and I wanna make the point here that even if you did have a psychiatric syndrome or disorder, that that doesn't necessarily categorically exclude you from having made or being eligible for made. And the reason for that is that the psychiatric syndrome may not render you incapable to make decisions around your healthcare needs. And in fact, there's a lot of people with a lot of psychiatric syndromes that we allow to make lots of decisions about their healthcare. Um, I think the point we wanna make here is that we want to do a very careful assessment around capacity. That's why we put up that original slide so that we would think about those individual components of capacity assessment um, and uh, try to figure out um, how the presence of any of those psychiatric sim uh, symptoms might actually be affecting his decision making. And the importance of this is also to, to do serial assessments over time. I think this is a, a critical sort of criteria to sort of not just respond or react to an acute situation, but to take our time to try to figure out what is going on with a particular individual. Um, so yeah. uh, at the time also, uh, I just want to make a note of this. Um, and, and this will come up in the new legislation. Um, we weren't dealing with just somebody with a psychiatric syndrome that actually came in with a suicide attempt. This man had a pancreatic cancer as well. So in our sort of way of thinking, it was easy for us to sort of revert back into the, oh yes, he's got another reason to ask for a maid. Um, that made our sort of deliberations a little bit different um, instead of just looking for, um, looking at his, as psychiatric illness as being the sole underlying cause. I think this is you as well. <laughs> um, sure. Um, so uh, again, this idea of suffering, um, I think, is a really important one. It's certainly embedded in the legislation that the person has to be experiencing intolerable suffering. Um, in this slide, I think we want to make the point that suffering is a very individual experience. And suffering is not just equated to the presence of symptoms. In fact, suffering has to do with the interpretation of a person's symptoms, whether they're physical, psychological, or spiritual, or existential. <clears throat> and uh, that takes into account sort of who that person is, right? And, and we think that it's super important when doing a MEET assessment to really understand what a person's values are, how they've lived their life, what's important to them, um, what experiences they've had in the past around 
um, cancer or any other life-threatening illness or their experience with death because we know that that informs how somebody thinks about dying um, and the process of dying. We want to note, <clears throat> we also wanted to emphasize and caution here that when we think about suffering, I think um, we also think about this quality of empathy that I hope we all have. And empathy is that ability to understand and appreciate somebody else's suffering and in fact probably experience their suffering to an extent. The risk here is that we project our own degree of suffering on the other individual and we make judgments on the basis of that. I think it's really important that we understand our own sort of sense of what suffering is um, and that we actually um, sometimes use this as a bit of a guidepost clearly, but at the same time, don't use it as the measure of the other person's suffering and that we really try to have that sense of empathy and put ourselves in the other person's shoes to understand what their situation is. Back to you, Sarah. Yeah, th th thanks, uh, Bill. So, um, so all of what Bill described is sort of what we we endeavored to tackle with this gentleman um, when he was admitted to hospital. And um, as mentioned, our approach was to sort of serially explore all of this with him. I, I put the slide up here just to sort of outline um, some of the sort of questions and things that we would have been exploring with him, um, such as around why he's asking for MAID, um, what his understanding is around what his end of life would look like, um, and what his understanding is of, of the actual the alternatives to receiving medical assistance in dying, i.e. Um, increased symptom management, um, sedation if the symptom management um, that we were undertaking wasn't effective. Um, and also increased um, supports if he was, you know, fearful of this of future disability, as he, uh, as he had mentioned. So all all of this was kind of just going into our our day to day assessments with him um, while kind of ramping up his uh, his symptom management with his permission, and actually with escalation of his opioids and some. Um, pleural drains inserted, his pain and dyspnea improved quite significantly. Um, and what he then said to us is, you know what, I, I, I don't think I, I need to go down the main route right now. Um, I'm feeling physically better. I'm feeling supported. Um, and I feel sort of like I've regained a sense of control over things and I have something to live for. But in the future, if my symptoms were worse, uh, and or um, my autonomy was compromised and I didn't sort of feel as well as I do now, I would want to pursue MAID in future. And so um, that was sort of where we left things with him on that admission. And we discharged him home with some good um, supports and follow up with his family doc in conjunction with a specialist palliative care team. And just to stay on this slide for a little bit more, just to go back. Um, uh, I think it's really important. There's a study in the past that has sort of emphasized what people are looking for at end of life. And I think it's important to go through this sort of thing. Um, uh, really, um, the study found that the five most important things that people were looking for at end of life is um, relieving pain and good symptom management, avoiding an inappropriate prolongation of life, achieving some sense of control in their lives, uh, relieving the burden of care on other people. This is a really big thing for a lot of people that they feel that their care is so hard <clears throat> on families around them. And also the possibility of strengthening personal relationships. So a lot of what we were sort of trying to do for this individual was to think about what was going on in these domains in his life and in providing what we believe to be adequate care, trying to address uh, these domains and, and uh, trying to help him um, find that support both within the hospital system and outside of the hospital system as well. And um, I also wanted to make one other point about the slide even prior to this. Um, it's this idea of sort of exploring the request. Um, and uh, in our paper that we wrote a while back, we came up with about, I don't know, about 25 different questions um, to ask an individual <clears throat> and I just want to actually highlight a couple of those questions because I think they're particularly important in understanding that person. Um, so the first one that a lot of people don't ask in a MAID assessment is just describe yourself as a person, right? See what they say, 
see what comes out just spontaneously without any prompting whatsoever. Um, it's amazing what people will tell you about themselves. And you can actually get a lot of information about a person just in a very short narrative paragraph. Um, what is your previous experience with death and dying? Again, this is so important because it informs how people project their own death and dying process. Um, and this is a great opportunity to make sure that people have good information, accurate information about what that process looks like. Um, uh, what would you like me to understand about your current situation? Um, so again, not presuming anything, not presuming that the things that are important to me are important to this particular individual, but really trying to understand his situation, his sort of fears, hopes, uh, as he finds himself in his current predicament. Um, and some of the other questions are more sort of practical questions about just understanding what actually MAID looks like, their experience with MAID. Um, uh, one of the questions we do recommend is this idea of uh, the idea of feeling helpless or hopeless as well. Um, and uh, again, there's a little bit of conflation between the idea of helplessness and hopelessness and actually the presence of a psychiatric syndrome. Um, and again, I'm not sure that's a fair conflation, whether hopelessness and helplessness can exist outside of the context of a psychiatric syndrome. In any case, we feel it's important to explore the idea of what they're hopeless about or what they feel helpless about, again, to see if we can mitigate that in any way, shape, or form. Um, uh, yeah, good. Thanks, Bill, that's helpful. Um, so I'll, I'll go through the next little bit in terms of how the case ended a little bit more quickly, just so that we have time um, to talk about the new bill that's just passed and then have time for questions. But um, unfortunately, a week after this gentleman was discharged, he was taken back to the eMERGE um, after holding a knife to his throat in, a, in an apparent suicidal gesture again. Um, when we met him that time, he was actually found to be quite delirious, um, but again, assented to voluntary admission to hospital. Um, couldn't find a cause for his delirium that was reversible and by day four, quite agitated uh, with fluctuating level of consciousness um, and really doing poorly. Um, and interestingly, at that point, um, I provided him and his wife the option of palliative sedation, uh, which they agreed on, but we never actually started that. He died within the hour. Um, so a bit of like a dra dramatic presentation in terms of the beginning of the case and a dramatic ending, which is sometimes how these things go. Um, and just to say that as sort of a final thing around the case, um, you know, the serial assessments over time, which we've already alluded to, and the understanding of who he is and how he was reacting to his illness, um, all of that was so critical to understanding how to help him at each time point, including on this final uh, admission and sort of not, uh, it helped us to not just um, have a basic interpretation of this apparent suicidal gesture with a knife. It, you know, it gave us some context in terms of what he's sort of uh, been through and how he sees his illness and himself situated within his illness to be able to understand how to help him in that moment and how to help them in that moment was to kind of support him, um, you know, try to um, guide him through that that last sort of phase of things and and provide him with, hopefully with some peace at the end, although unfortunately, he just sort of died suddenly uh, afterward. Um, so I don't know if you had any final reflections on the case, uh, Bill, before I move into the, the final part of our talk. I guess just to emphasize the point of getting to know the individual and really the, the, the way to get to know an individual, I think, is actually through multiple assessments, leaving lots of time to understand uh, who they are and what they value. Absolutely. Um, so Bill C7, uh, hot off the press, um, which, was, which we've alluded to, um, has been a few months in the making now. It's sort of bounced back and forth between the Senate and the House. Um, and just um, a few days ago was uh, given uh, final approval by the House of Commons. Um, so I'll, I'll go into the details of it, um, but essentially this was based around a case in Quebec um, where they, um, they proposed to strike down the death uh, reasonably foreseeable clause that existed in Bill C-14 um, because it was felt to not be consistent with the Canadian Charter. 
Um, and so when they drafted the bill initially, it was it was largely about creating these two camps of people who would qualify for MAID, um, one in the camp of uh, a reasonably foreseeable death, um, so very similar to Bill C-14, and the separate camp of people whose death is not reasonably foreseeable, but they're suffering and they meet all of the other criteria. And when the bill was initially drafted, um, patients whose sole uh, medical condition um, was a mental illness um, were actually uh, excluded from uh, the bill. But when it went to the Senate, the Senate came back and said, um, we're proposing the amendment that um, although people with solely a mental illness are excluded, we want there to be a time limit on that. So they had said 18 months from now, people who are suffering from severe PTSD or severe depression, but no other uh, medical illness um, should be able to access MAID. And the House actually uh, approved that just recently, although they extended it to a two-year time limit. Um, so, so as it stands today, um, Bill C-7 has come into effect. Patients with um, you know, severe depression, severe PTSD as their sole underlying condition are not currently able to access MAID, um, but our understanding is that two years from now that will come into effect. Um, and uh, and the, the government has committed, I guess, to creating um, a working group or an expert panel to sort of come up, try to come up with a set of safeguards uh, for this population in particular, but otherwise we have no sort of details around um, what that would exactly look like. Um, so as I said, what is now in effect is made is now uh, legal for patients whose death is reasonably foreseeable, but also for patients whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. And I'll, I'll go through um, sort of what um, the process looks like for both of those groups of people. So for patients whose death is reasonably foreseeable, so these are these are the patients like the guy that we presented in our case and who were eligible previously under Bill C-14. There are some modifications in um, the new law um, that sort of increase access uh, or accessibility um, for made for these people. So one change um, in Bill C-7 is that whereas previously um, these patients would have to have a written request signed by two witnesses. Um, they now only require one witness. Um, and this change was made because the feeling was that two witnesses um, were, were creating a barrier to access for these patients, especially during COVID, especially in sort of remote and vulnerable populations. And so you now only need one witness if your death is reasonably foreseeable. Um, and that person just can't be a beneficiary uh, under your will uh, or um, the person assessing you for your made request or providing made, but it actually now can be a, a care provider. Um, so a physician who's not, who knows you, but who isn't actually helping you with the made request. Um, previously, there was a, a mandatory 10 day reflection period. They've removed that for patients whose, de whose death is reasonably foreseeable um, because it wasn't sort of felt to add anything meaningful and, and, and it wasn't really sort of changing things. It was just kind of putting up a barrier for, for this population. Um, and finally, there are exceptions made to the requirement for final consent. So in Bill C-14, you actually have to be able to sign off on the day of your procedure and say, yes, I'm still capable and I still want to go ahead with MAID. Um, now, um, if a clinician uh, feels that you're at imminent risk of loss of capacity, um, they can enter into a written agreement with you um, that says that you know, you're setting a date for a made procedure, um, let's say like five days in the future. And if you lose capacity on that date or before that date, um, then you're eligible to receive made as long as, um, in, the, in the legislation they say, as long as in words or gestures or whatever, it doesn't look like the person is then refusing the procedure. Um, so that, that is a, a change as well. Um, and, and I just want to point out that that's not the same thing as advanced consent for MAID. This is not, you know, your people who are um, making a request for MAID and, and want to be able to activate that like a month or two months in the future. This is really you're at imminent loss of uh, risk of loss of capacity. You've set a date for a procedure in the range of like short days um, and you and you would go ahead 
if you lost capacity in that interval. Um, and then Bill C-7 um, creates safeguards for um, patients whose death is not reasonably foreseeable as well, which is the big change. Um, so for these patients, they actually need a minimum 90-day uh, assessment period. Um, and one of the two made assessments um, needs to be completed by a, a, quote, practitioner with expertise in the condition that is causing the person's suffering. Although our understanding is that um, if access to such a person um, to be able to do the MAID assessment is, is difficult, you could actually have two MAID assessments by any clinician and then just seek the expertise of that practitioner with expertise in the condition separately. Um, so the, the person with expertise doesn't necessarily have to be one of the MAID assessors, but they have to actually sort of weigh in on um, the nature of the person's illness and their suffering. Um, and um, there, there isn't right now anyway clear guidance in the legislation as to like who this practitioner would be. Um, so they've said that it, it's not necessarily like a specialist in the condition and that they have to have expertise and there otherwise are no sort of safeguards or um, clear rules around that uh, as of now. Um, and then finally, the patient needs to be made aware at least and offered appropriate counseling services as part of sort of this whole uh, assessment period and process. Um, so that's Bill C-7 in a nutshell. Um, and at this point, maybe we'll open things up for discussion. Um, and I think Angel is gonna help us uh, moderate that. So yeah, we'll, we'll take questions and discussion points, I guess, around anything from Bill C-7 to the case, to our learning, et cetera. Great, thank you so much, Sarah and Bill. Uh, so for the audience, it's now time for our discussion. And if you'd like to uh, enter a question, you can put it in the YouTube chat uh, if you're logged in. If you're not logged into YouTube, uh, what you can do if you'd like to send a question um, or submit anonymously, you can send it to Lori dot bullchack at utoronto.ca. And I believe her email should be at the top of the um, YouTube question log there as well. Okay, and um, for those watching, um, just also know that we're gonna try to prioritize the questions for our speakers um, and save the comments towards the end. And anything that we don't get to today will be sent to them afterwards so that we'll get all of your wonderful feedback. Right. Um, so I thought maybe um, I would start with a question um, that I had. Um, with respect to uh, the initial clinical encounter with um, Mr. S and the decision um, to discuss made, but not to provide uh, the clinician 8A. So I'm curious um, if uh, sort of the opportunity to make a written request, um, if that information was given to him um, and uh, sort of what that conversation might've been like. And um, if, you, if you have any sort of thoughts around the concerns that might come up around gatekeeping, right? So right now the bar to make a written request is actually fairly low. Anybody can make it. It doesn't mean that they'll you know, be eligible or pursue made. Um, but um, I wonder if um, for some patients that might also be uh, an important act of sort of empowerment. So having that information or knowing that they can do it or having that form submitted, even if they choose not to pursue the, the process. So with Mr. S, um, did he know that he could write the written request or that, um, that you're advising a delay and thoughts? Yeah, I'll, maybe I'll take that bill. So, since I made that comment, sorry, I should have been more clear with my comment earlier. So absolutely, if if he had wanted to make a request, um, we, we would not stand in his way of signing a request form and helping to sort of facilitate that. Um, I think it was quite complex because he, um, also had these unmet symptoms and, and was interested in sort of seeing what we could do to kind of improve that. And so although he was interested in MAID, he was also interested in trying some other things first and sort of trying to work with us. Um, so I, I, I think in that moment, it was more that he wanted to come into the hospital and kind of work on some of these things further with, with us and have us to help him. Um, and that was the reason he probably didn't sign the request in that moment. Um, I guess what I was more sort of saying was, um, 
that we didn't start like all of the, the assessment processes and our own sort of formal made assessments within the eMERGE. So not so much the written request piece, but actually the, the sort of the formal assessments without first, first sort of exploring some of this further. Um, and that actually wouldn't have um, been a barrier if we didn't do those assessments right away. Like if he really wanted to sign the written request, with the old legislation, the clock would have started ticking at the time the request was signed. So it actually wouldn't have delayed his ability to access MAID. It would have just given us a little bit more time to better understand his capacity and sort of who he was and his reasons for, for looking at, uh, at MAID. I think I just want to add a, a tiny bit of comment to that as well. I, I think in terms of um, it being a sort of a very highly charged environment in which it has taken a substantial overdose, what we really wanted to create was the sense of a caring, compassionate, and open-minded environment for him. Um, and I think that the creation of that environment is so important and, and, and actually um, having us understand, having him understand that we were open to the idea of uh, accessing me and talking about me, I think was enough in that moment. Great, thank you. Um, now, I think you've answered a bit of our next two questions. So I'll, I'll um, read them both out to you in case there's anything you wanna add. They both relate to um, the response um, uh, around symptom management in particular. So Blair Henry um, asks, why would you assess capacity for MAID when the patient had untreated physical distress? Um, we would not accept a request until that was explored. And then uh, Franco Barbati similarly asks, why do we wait for the person to be so desperate that they have proper follow-up pain and symptom management? So um, I, I think uh, I, I wanna be careful about sort of this either or type of thinking. I think what we want to be very careful about is doing a, a bit of a calm current assessment where if somebody um, wishes to make a very formal request and go ahead with that request. We also talk about some of these other issues around symptom management and actually make efforts with, of course, that person's permission to try to alleviate uh, symptoms as well. Um, I don't think we would take the sort of, um, I think we would want to help him understand how this might contribute to his desire to die um, without necessarily dissuading him from moving ahead with that. Yeah, I, I would agree with uh, all of that. I think our, our approach in the hospital was to kind of do both because he gave us permission to um, to try to get his symptoms under, under better control. Obviously, that's not the case for all patients. Some patients might have just sort of said like, don't even try with the opioids, et cetera. Like just, just help me with this request. And, and so our approach would be different in that case. We, you know, we wouldn't force him to um, go through sort of our suggested interventions, um, but I think it is appropriate to kind of do both concurrently. I, I wonder if one of those questions was getting at the fact that he came to us already in so much distress, um, and it was unfortunate that um, that distress hadn't been caught earlier, and unfortunately we, we didn't know him prior to that, um, that catastrophic moment, but I completely agree that um, this probably could have been caught earlier and some supports put in place earlier before he had to attempt a, an overdose. Thank you. Uh, so Amanda Stu asks um, how, how made a made request is different from being suicidal. So are those different or the same? And if you could say a bit more about that. Um, so, I think there's a fundamental sort of question here as to how one defines suicidal. Um, you know, I, I, I like the terminology wish, not wish for haste and death, actually. Um, and uh, I like it partially because it takes us out of that psychiatric lexicon again, where there's an automatic assumption that suicidality is necessarily a bad thing. Um, so um, again, some people feel that the desire to die actually comes in the presence of um, overwhelming circumstances for that particular individual. Um, and suicide is seen as sort of the only escape to, um, to relieve that sense of suffering. Um, and again, this is the importance of addressing and understanding the person's suffering, finding out what's bothering them, and, and if we can address it, um, with their permission, trying to address it. Um, I see this as sort of a continuum. Um, 
I think the other thing that we notice, and, and this is going back to the sort of psychiatric lexicon, is that when we have things like uncontrolled pain, there's a lovely study done by a palliative care psychiatrist that demonstrates that when you have uncontrolled pain, your actual desire to die or suicidality, as he called it, spikes immediately. Um, so, um, so we know that there are some circumstances that lead to this desire. I think it's really important that we take a much more nuanced approach in understanding this idea of desire to die. Thank you. Uh, so we have an anonymous question. They ask, so if there's felt to be a depressive disorder that's concurrent with suicidality or the desire to die, how do we balance treatment with antidepressants in cases of terminally ill people, especially if the treatment takes four to six weeks to work, but the prognosis is only weeks or months? So there's a, a multi-pronged sort of approach to this answer. Um, absolutely, this person is correct in sort of saying antidepressants take a long time. Um, I think, again, it's the idea of... Um, that there are different degrees of depression and to ask the question whether that depression is actually, um, how much is it influencing this person's decision to die? Um, so for example, if there's always, uh, and this is the importance again of longitudinal history of a person has values that have always been congruent with me and they find themselves in a situation of a physical illness um, and they are experiencing or exhibiting some psychiatric symptoms as a consequence of that we know that in a lot of cases with uh, progressive cancer, you'll see most of the symptoms of depression in a person, um, including sadness. Um, uh, um, uh, I think the idea is again to look at the degree of depression, first of all, um, decide sort of how much it's influencing them or, or try to make some sort of evaluation of that. Um, talk about potential treatments. And there are other, tr other treatment options that are available to people. And I think the person who's asking the question brings out a really important quandary, right? Sometimes we can treat some symptoms like energy, for example, with some very quick acting medications, like a, a stimulant medication that actually alleviates the symptom under question. Sometimes in a more extreme case, we might even consider something like ECT, which is a very fast treatment, um, depending on what the person's prognosis might be um, and, uh, and see if that sort of works. Um, so there are some ways of uh, looking at depression. There's certainly some psychotherapeutic interventions um, that sometimes look at a person's fears and can address those fears in a very effective manner, particularly in a mild depressive episode. So I think there are some other options besides medications. Medications are, are one option. Uh, so on a related note, Dr. Andrew Adams asked if you could um, also talk about say a little bit about those with treatment resistant depression and what that might need for me. So I'm wondering if I can actually get a clarification of that question. Are we talking about um, treatment resistant depression um, and, and um, that being the sole underlying reason why somebody is asking for me? Um, and while we're looking for that clarification, I will remind people that when we talk about treatment resistant depression, um, the classical definition is that they failed two treatments. Um, two treatments is not a lot of treatments in the lexicon or the, the, the sort of armamentarium of actually treating depression. Um, so I think it's really important that again, we consider, and, and this is getting into that sort of how do we even make an assessment for somebody who's asking for it or made under the circumstances of only having a mental disorder. Um, and uh, I'm probably not gonna do it justice. So before I try to hammer away at it, I'm gonna actually um, make reference to a paper that was written by Mona Gupta as a chair of the um, Quebec Psychiatric Association sort of committee that's uh, advising the Quebec Psychiatric Association on MAID. Um, she's written a very lovely paper um, that sort of addresses a lot of the issues uh, that are brought about by the question that's being asked. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I, maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay, so I'll, I'll keep my eye out for any clarification of that question. Um, we do have a uh, question that's uh, related to that, um, to your comments around treatment and how many treatments somebody has tried. And Amanda Stu asks, 
um, particularly in the case for those with a reasonably foreseeable natural death. You may want to comment on the other stream as well, um, so that they only have to know about the treatments um, and seriously consider them, but they don't have to actually try them um, before receiving MAID. Um, so if you have any thoughts on that sort of aspect of the criteria that you'd like to comment on. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that's correct. Um, that's the way that the legislation is written. Um, is it's important to sort of explore things and offer alternatives. Um, but um, if somebody says, I, I don't want uh, increased pain management, um, they, they still would, they would be eligible for MAID. And that's sort of seen as their, uh, their individual decision or right to refuse that treatment. And maybe an additional point to that, and it, it may speak to the treatment resistant depression piece. There's something about chronicity of treatment and sort of people uh, having multiple attempts and failed attempts that actually, um, I think sometimes informs somebody's willingness, somebody's willingness to actually try one more thing. Um, and it can actually feel quite demoralizing to the person to be proposed one more treatment. Um, so I think we wanna be very cognizant of how we approach the idea of even proposing treatments to people and sort of be, be wise and cautious about what we expect treatment outcomes to be as well. And I, I think that comes back to, I think Blair Henry's earlier question about like, you know, leaving people until they're kind of in extremis. Um, I, I think it just is, is further support for um, getting to people early on and, and sort of exploring things early on and offering things early on rather than you know, when they've gotten to a point where they've sort of lost trust in the system or lost trust in the ability of uh, care providers to actually reverse what's happening to them. So just a case for, in general, like good care uh, early on. Mm -hmm. um, so Val, me asks if um, you can say a bit about your thoughts on where the line gets drawn between reasonably foreseeable natural death and non-reasonably foreseeable natural death. Um, in particular, so they give the example of CHF, which they say could be both or either. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, I think, you know, part of the reason why um, these two branches were created is because there's been so much subjectivity in the interpretation of this idea of reasonably foreseeable death, um, the way it was worded in Bill C-14. And as as Bill mentioned, you know, you don't have to have stated a specific prognosis. And so individual cl clinicians in our experience have kind of chosen to interpret reasonably foreseeable in, in many different ways. And so in some ways, having these two branches um, kind of helps to safeguard things, I suppose. Um, I, I think as far as individual um, diagnoses, it would really just depend on the, the patient scenario. Like I can envision a patient with advanced CHF whose death would definitely be reasonably foreseeable if they were doing poorly versus others who were sort of more like chronically stable and we weren't sort of clear on the trajectory they were earlier in their diagnosis. Um, so I think it just, it depends on, it, it still just comes down to the individual clinician and how they kind of, uh, how they kind of interpret uh, that. And the law doesn't give us a lot of, uh, even in its new form, a lot of guidance around who fits um into which camp and, and i think this also again speaks to the idea of serial communication with the person um understanding what their fears are as their chf progresses and why they're asking for something at any particular stage of say if, if it was chf for example um to make sure that somebody's not basing their decisions on things that uh, misinformation or some sort of assumption they're making that might not be true thanks I see here we have a clarification from Dr. Andrew Adams. Um, he says, yes, I was just wondering since the treatment resistant depression is not a well-defined term and how it might um, those requesting may be harmed or affected with that. Yeah, um, just to go back to that paper by Mona Gupta, I saw in the chat, there's a, a question about sort of where is it? Um, the quickest way to find it is probably to do Quebec Psychiatric Association, Mona Gupta, MAID, and it will come up as one, one of the first three hits. Um, I actually don't have it. That's how I found it. So, um, sorry, can you just repeat that, um, the clarification? Oh, because it's, yeah, okay. It's not clear. Um, I think in her paper, um, 
she talks about some proposed ways of sort of assessing somebody for MAID. And, and she talks about uh, chronicity of treatment, for example. I think this would be really important. Um, when we're thinking about treatment-resistant depression, and since we know that antidepressants take a long time uh, to see a treatment effect, or even some psychotherapies may take a longer time to see an effect as well, um, that we want to make sure that the person has had an adequate course of treatment and had, had, has had several adequate courses of treatment as well. And uh, a lot of psychiatrists believe that any uh, the period of time before you would even call it treatment resistant in a, in a, I guess, a broader definition than what the classical definition is, is at least five years of treatment, um, or maybe even 10 years of unremitting symptoms within the context of treatment and adequate treatment. So uh, I think that's one, one way of thinking about it. So um, I'm just looking through, we have tons of questions, so we're not going to get through them all today. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, and uh, someone asks, uh, many palliative care practitioners and organizations appear to not be supportive of MAID as an end-of-life choice. Do you have any suggestions as to the best way to convince these practitioners to accept MAID as simply a part of the continuum of care for end-of-life options? Oh, good. You finished with an easy question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, maybe I'll take that. I mean, I don't, as I mentioned at the outset of this outset of this presentation, our role in giving this talk and my role in my work is not to convince any individual practitioner that they need to participate in MAID um, whatsoever. It is a very individual choice and we I think we all respect um, respect that right to, to conscientious objection. It is, however, every uh, clinician's responsibility to make an appropriate referral. And so in those cases, I would just hope that, um, that colleagues are, are making referrals to other individuals who are, are willing to participate uh, in the process. And uh, maybe I'll invite you both, any, any final thoughts and parting words of wisdom? Go ahead, Sarah. I'll just follow you. <laughs> no, no, no. Final thoughts. Thank you for all the the great uh, the great questions. I wish we could see all your faces, uh, although that would probably be even more intimidating. Um, and happy to answer um, try to answer those questions offline, as Angel mentioned. Um, I'm sure Angel will let us know what avenue to take to to get back to you individually. Um, and I, I'm sure we'll have more discussions as a community. I think moving forward now that this new bill has passed, it's all very fresh to, to all of us, including Bill and myself. And so we're still digesting and reflecting on what this means for us as, as individual practitioners, but also as a, as, a, as a group in terms of psychiatry and palliative care. So I'm sure there'll be more discussions to be had. Yeah, I, you know, I, I think my final thought would be that uh, um, uh, MAID has always been a controversial topic. And um, there's, it certainly a, can be a polarizing topic. Um, and certainly with the new uh, bill that's come out, I think it uh, has led to even more polarization potentially. I think we need to continue to have an open dialogue about what this sort of means and looks like. And um, now that it is sort of looking like it's becoming law that we actually have, uh, we, we, we seriously consider um, issues like uh, mental illness is so underlying reason to ask for me and we really try to grapple with what seem like very challenging issues at this point. Um, and I, I, I hope people join that conversation. Uh, a lot of voices are, are helpful. That's wonderful, thank you so much. So unfortunately it's time to draw today's seminar to a close. I have a couple of announcements to make before we thank our speakers. So first, our next seminar will be on Wednesday, March 31st. Gia Lin and Sarah Paul will be discussing family veto and organ and tissue donation. Uh, second, to sign up to receive our weekly seminar reminder via email, um, you can send an email to jcb.info at utoronto.ca. Um, and third, uh, CBS, C, sorry, CSB students enrolled in the CSB student seminar course um, please remember to keep track of your attendance. And um, last but certainly not least, Sarah and Bill, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much for your excellent presentation today. Thank you for having us. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening.